Welcome to a Legendarium special about the history behind Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. By the Victorian age, the profession of psychology remained in its infancy. Both medical professionals and the public had a vague understanding of personality disorders such as split personalities. And newly discovered narcotics like cocaine slowly crept into the mainstream as doctors prescribed them for physical and mental illnesses. Yet psychology cannot explain evil, especially when it wears a respectable face. Author Robert Louis Stevenson's home country of Scotland had a connection to the subject of split personalities. Sixty years before Stevenson's birth, an Edinburgh cabinet maker named Deacon Brodie enjoyed access to the houses of the city's wealthiest families to work his trade. Those families later reported their valuables disappearing. In time, the authorities realized that Brody had been robbing his customers for years, and after his arrest, the court ordered Brody to hang upon a gallows that he himself designed. It baffled Scots at the time that a respected man with a trade, a family, and plenty of work would do such things. Indeed, Stevenson grew up in a house that had a Brody cabinet inside. Unsurprisingly, Stevenson became fascinated by Brody's story and the subject of split personalities. He hoped to write a story about the topics, but could not figure out how. One night he had a vivid and horrifying dream. His wife Fanny later wrote, In the small hours of the morning I was awakened by cries of horror from Lewis. Thinking he had a nightmare, I awakened him. He said angrily, Why did you wake me? I was dreaming a fine bogey tale. The dream apparently involved a man being pressed into a Brody cabinet where he changed into another man completely. Stevenson often suffered from poor health throughout his life, and he wrote Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde while recovering from a lung hemorrhage. Nonetheless, he wrote the first draft of the 30,000-word novella within six days. He likely went into his working frenzy because his doctors prescribed him medical cocaine to reduce the bleeding caused by his illness. And this could also have inspired the infamous fever dream. In time, Stevenson confessed that he became too fond of cocaine and used it to help fuel his frenzied writing, which might explain why Dr. Jekyll loses control of his addiction to the potion. After his wife read the original novella, she offered a truly scathing review. It seems that the usually patient and loving Fanny suddenly exploded. This has led some to believe that the first draft described Mr. Hyde's crimes and behavior in repulsive detail, and possibly hinted at crimes of a sexual nature. Later, Fanny found her husband lying in bed. He pointed to a pile of ashes in the fireplace and said he burned the unsatisfying draft. His wife nearly fainted and urged him to write it again. He cranked out a second draft in only three days, though it took six weeks of hard editing in late 1885 before Stevenson judged it ready for publication in early 1866. It became an immediate success, selling 40,000 copies in only six months. By year's end, more than a quarter million pirated copies circulated in North America. It tells the story of the good Dr. Jekyll, who is so ashamed of any sinful thoughts that he goes to great efforts to hide them. This possibly comes from Stevenson's own Calvinist upbringing, which he later turned against. In time, this leads Jekyll, an accomplished chemist, to create a potion that will allow him to transform himself into a different man named Mr. Hyde, who can indulge himself. A Christian reading public seized on the moral message of the story. Many became convinced that Dr. Jekyll was a secret homosexual and that this led to his downfall. They wrote about this topic in religious newspapers and preachers gave sermons about it in churches. Stevenson himself insisted that he never intended to impart this, but people, as they always do, believe what they wanted to believe. Within a year, theaters across Scotland and the United States produced a play based on the book. 
Richard Mansfield played Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde to rave reviews, and only two days after the play opened on London's West End, Jack the Ripper began his infamous killing spree. Before long, people started connecting Jack the Ripper to the stage adaptation, with some suggesting that the play poisoned the killer's mind. Still, others thought that Mansfield himself committed the murders, and letters to the editor claimed that Mansfield played a killer too well not to be Jack the Ripper. Despite the mass hysteria, Mansfield never faced charges and became an accomplished Shakespearean actor later in life. By 1931, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde had already been adapted for film 24 times. However, the 1931 version impressed critics the most with its transformation scene involving actor Frederick March. The secret of how director Ruben Mamolian filmed the transformation scene would not be revealed until the late 1960s. He later revealed that he did so with colored makeup and matching colored filters either removed or added to the scene to change March's appearance. And since the film appeared in black and white, the color changes simply did not show and audiences only saw the actor's changing face. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.